Noah here at the Denver Center. Thank you. Mom. It's my mom over there. Uh, I, no, it's not my mom. Uh, I, you give me a microphone and this is going to be a long night. Um, we are here uh, to spend some time with playwrights. These are, uh, tonight we're going to uh, be reading from some of our work. Um, Anybody who attended the uh, conversation we had last night knows now that playwrights make the best actors. And um, especially when they're reading their own work, because we sit there and we listen to actors say it wrong. <laughs> and we quietly say to ourselves, if I were doing it, it would go like this. So this is the one and only opportunity where playwrights have an opportunity to show you what it actually sounds like in our heads. Um, we're going to start. I, uh, I'm going to go first, because that's what I do. So because I get nervous, I'm going to sit up here, and I'm going to use the mic. So, okay. So I'm going to do this, too, because I get very nervous. Um, uh, so this is from my new play. Uh, it's called The Inheritance. Um, it is the only thing you need to know about this scene. Um, the play is uh, loosely, very loosely based on uh, E.M. Forster's Howard's End. Um, it's set in uh, contemporary. And uh, what you need to know about this scene is that Toby and Eric uh, have been together for about seven years. And uh, Toby is a playwright. <laughs> and Eric uh, is a blogger. Uh, they live in a five-bedroom apartment on the Upper East Side that uh, has been grand literally grandfathered to Eric uh, that they are rent-controlled stealing. Um, but they're about to lose the apartment because the uh, owners of the building have caught on to their little scheme. And Toby has just had a smash hit play in Chicago. Yeah. And it's going to Broadway. And he feels like uh, the director and the star have taken all the credit, and he's not getting any credit for his own work. And so he uh, he still has some things to prove. So they uh, they have to leave their home of seven years, this palatial apartment, and they are uh, looking for new apartments. Uh, so they're at home with their laptops, looking at apartments. Um, it starts with Eric, so you can keep track of the back and the forth. Uh, Here's a nice place, but neighborhood. Cobble Hill, I don't want to live in Brooklyn. <laughs> Everyone's moving there. Then there should be plenty of apartments in Manhattan to choose from. <laughs> At least in Brooklyn we can find a place with space. I have a play opening on Broadway in the spring. I just sold the film rights. Why don't I just buy an apartment? Do you ever read the Times real estate section? <laughs> My advances should be arriving any day now, and you have to live off of that until the show opens. And even then, you have to wait until it starts making money. It'll make money. And where do you think you can afford to buy it? With your credit? Toby, even if your show were a hit, the best we could possibly afford is somewhere in Brooklyn. Somewhere far out in Brooklyn. <laughs> Who are all these people buying houses and apartments then? Russians. <laughs> Why don't we rent a place for a year, and then if the show recoups, we can look into buying something. I'm not leaving Manhattan. We can maybe afford a one-bedroom in Midtown. I need more space than that, which is why I'm looking in Brooklyn. What about Williamsburg? It's just a quick ride to the city. Yeah, when the trains are working. <sighs> Park Slope, I detest yoga. <laughs> well, there's always Astoria. No, there isn't. <laughs> You have to work with me here. We, you just can't say no to every idea. Well, what about Los Angeles? I hate Los Angeles. Don't be such a cliched New Yorker. I can hate Los Angeles without being a cliche. Besides, my work is here. But my agent thinks I could get work on a series if I wanted. Why don't you just stay in New York and start working on another play? No one actually works in theater anymore. It's television's waiting room. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> my character speaking, not me. <laughs> okay, now I have to tell you, you screwed up my setup. 
don't boo me this time. Why don't you just stay in New York and start working on another play? No one actually works in theater anymore. It's television's waiting room. Well, then who are all these people working in theater right now? Those who didn't get pilots this season. <laughs> My character, okay? <laughs> what if I went to Los Angeles and you stay here? Listen to me, Toby. I don't want to stay here. Yeah, we could be by coastal for a while. How would that save us money? We could each get tiny places. Do you think you're actually being subtle right now? I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, you do. I promise I don't. Most people would take a moment to consider how difficult this transition might be for their partner. But not you, Toby. The second thing is get a little challenging. You want to bolt for California. Just until rehearsals start, for seven years I have been caring you financially. And now that you've got just a little bit of success, you've not been caring for me financially. This is bullshit. You couldn't even afford a studio in bed style without me. And instead, you've been living it up rent-free in this palatial apartment and acting as if you belong here. Okay, first of all, it's hardly palatial. The kitchen hasn't been updated since the Carter administration. The refrigerator is harvest gold, for God's sake. You want out, and you're just too scared to say it. That's not true. You know I would never move to Los Angeles. You know I would never leave the city. I, I think you just want different things. Ah, just be honest with me, please. Just tell me you want out. I know, I need to know this, if I'm doing this alone or not. I just think we're headed in two different directions. Yeah, meaning you think you're ascendant and don't want the inconvenience of having a boyfriend around messing up your fun. Now that I don't have this apartment to offer you, now that success is in your grasp, now that you think you can take care of yourself, you don't need me anymore, maybe, maybe even you think you can do better, but at least be honest and tell me that, Toby. I just want something new. Problem with that plan, Toby, is you'll still be stuck with yourself no matter where you land next. Thank you. <laughs> with Adam in Chicago? Adam's the lead in his play. <laughs> Did you sleep with Adam in Chicago? No. Did you want to? Well, of course I want to have sex with Adam. Who doesn't? I don't. Well, then there is something seriously wrong with you, Eric. He's gorgeous. There's more to people than beauty. Yeah, well, you would have to tell yourself that, wouldn't you? I didn't mean that. Actually, Toby, that's the first honest thing you've said this entire conversation. I suppose I should thank you. And since we are telling each other the truth, your play made me sick to my stomach. I actually threw up afterwards. You told me it was the oysters we ate at dinner. No, it was the play. You're insane! That play is the greatest thing I've ever done in my life. We're a huge fucking hit. We're moving to Broadway in the spring. You're just jealous because of Tom's brilliant production and because of Adam's heartbreaking performance. He's the heart and soul of that play. There would be no brilliant production or heartbreaking performance without my script. I am the heart and soul of the play. You have no heart or soul, Toby. You're all ambition and self-regard. Grown men wept at that play. Straight ones! Be because you manufactured it to have that precise effect. Your, place, your play was nothing but pure cynical calculation. All storytelling is cynical calculation. Haven't you ever seen a Hitchcock film? You've gotten so good at spinning people, you think you can spin me too. But you forget that unlike all the rest of your recently acquired acolytes, I know who you really are. Your book was a con job from start to finish, and your play was even worse. Not without talent, of course. God forbid anyone should accuse you of that. But worse, without integrity. You were so terrified of truly being known, of even facing it yourself, that you have spent the last decade of your life constructing this narrative that has nothing to do with the truth. And now you even believe it yourself. Adam's character isn't you. You know that, right? It's just who you want people to think you are, which of course makes Adam the perfect actor for it, because he's everything you've always wanted to be. I couldn't even look at you after I saw your play, because all of your self-delusions were up there on that stage, so beautifully rendered by Tom and Adam, neither of them having any idea that they're doing it all in the service of your sickness. And soon enough, all of New York is going to see it, and all your delusions will become that official story. And you, Toby, the flesh and blood man who once had such promise, that man who I met and was dazzled by and believed in will no longer exist. And all that will remain is your ambition, and your ego and delusions, and the only person who will know the truth is me. 
which is why you need to get as far away from me as possible, because I'm the only one who knows what a fraud you are, and more importantly, what wasted potential your life has become. And that's what you're too much of a coward to say. <laughs> well, if you feel this way about me, if this is who you think I am, then why have you stayed with me so long? Because I'm a coward too. That's it, thanks. Okay, now I'm like done. This is gonna be the easy part of the night. It gets so much easier, guys. Uh, first up is Lauren Yee. Lauren's play, The Word, is currently having a national new play network rolling world premiere, beginning at Straw Dog Theater Company in Chicago. Her play, King of the Yees, has been read at several new play festivals across the country. Lauren is a member of the Ma Yee Theater's Writer Lab and a Playwright Center core writer, Lauren Yee. If, if, if I try it without the microphone, like you'll tell me if I need it. Um, so I'm, I'm going to read a scene from my play, King of the Yees. Um, which is about me and my father. And the only thing that you kind of need to know is that this scene is between two Asian American actors who are on break in a hallway, kind of in between acting in this play. So, scene, hallway. So while we're out here, can I ask, ask, what I don't get, what don't you get? It's a men's club, it's a men's club for Chinese people named Yi. Right. Sorry, what don't you get? I guess my question is why? Why you'd want a men's club? Why you'd want to save it? So in the future, you can have an association of Yi men for some reason. I should have asked when we were rehearsing. Why didn't you? If I ask, then I'm the one asking, and I feel like she came in just expecting us to know, just because we're Chinese. Actually, I'm Korean. What? <laughs> don't, don't. Now you're going to get me in trouble. For being Korean? King of the Yees? So? I had no idea the whole thing was going to be so Chinese-centric. I figured they were just looking for general Asians. <laughs> well, fuck that. Fuck her. Thank you. Hey, I'm only three quarters Chinese. Really? My mother's mother was Irish. Oh, now I can see it. It's like a part of me is oppressing the rest of myself. Could she tell you're not full Asian? No, she can't tell. Even Asian people can't tell. I'm so relieved, though, I didn't have to do my Chinese accent. Why? Mine is so bad. Most Asians have awful Asian accents. No, but mine was like, we are Chinese. We are Chinese. <laughs> we are Chinese. Chinese. Cha cha cha. Chinese. How was that? Was that Chinese? Um, somebody told me that what you need to do is keep your mouth shut, so that when you talk, no, no. What my voice teacher said is that you do want to slap your jaw but you also want to keep pressure on the diaphragm. <laughs> Down here, Chinese. You're hitting more of the, the knees instead of the chai. Chinese, like you've been punched in the gut. Chinese, Chinese. Working in a rice paddy, Chinese. And there are bombs and Agent Orange raining down on you. Then you're just doing Vietnamese. No, wait, there, there are Japanese bombs raining down on you, Chinese. And you can't see with your conical hat and your eyes are really small, Chinese. So you have to lean forward to see, but you're still running from the Japanese bombs, Chinese, as the weight of your ancestors is on the lower part of your diaphragm. Chinese, and the expectations of your unborn ABC children are pressing down on the back of your throat. Chinese, but from the inside, and you speak like there is a sorrow. Chinese, buried so deeply inside of you here and here. Chinese, flatten the arts. Chinese, watch your tones. Chinese, dim sum carts. Chinese, lactose intolerance. Chinese, Chinese, Chinese. 
Chinese, Chinese, Chinese. <laughs> basically what Chinese people sound like and uh, my voice teacher spent two years living in Shanghai so she knows. <laughs> for, for Korean they say what you have to do is imagine that you're a woman which for me is easy and that someone is raping you and you want to scream but you've just had plastic surgery so you can't move your face. <laughs> Korean. <laughs> Korean. Korean. You'll probably never need it anyway. <laughs> Kemp is a resident playwright at Los Angeles' multi-award-winning Rogue Machine Theater Company, where his premiere play, One Night in Miami, enjoyed a sold-out four-month Los Angeles run in 2013 and received four LA Drama Critics Circle Awards as well as four NAACP Theater Awards. He has since enjoyed a groundbreaking run at Baltimore Center Stage and a successful run here at the Denver Center. And it, yes. And is currently in development for its first commercial run in London. Ladies and gentlemen, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Ken Powers. Is it okay if I stand? Right. I didn't expect you to just read my bio. Um, yeah, I'm gonna do a short scene from something new that I've been working on. It's called um, Little Black Shadows. It is a play about a family at a, uh, who lives on a cotton plantation in Georgia in the 1850s. Um, and they're in the process of trying to move to a sugar plantation in Louisiana. The characters are the mother, the father, their two twin 11-year-old children, and each of the t twins has their own 11-year-old child slave who sleeps under their bed at night. And the slaves only communicate with each other when the kids are asleep. Um, this scene is one where the father of the house is trying to teach his young son a lesson. I guess that's the best way to put it. <clears throat> we hear an uncharacteristic buzzing sound that starts off quietly, then grows in volume until it becomes nearly deafening. As the light of day returns, the stage is illuminated, revealing a large wasp nest hanging from the ceiling outside the front door of the house. Father is staring up at it chewing on a blade of grass as he takes it in. Daniel, his 11-year-old son, is watching father, and Colas, Daniel's 11-year-old slave, stands behind watching Daniel. Father, you know what that is? Sir? That, do you know what that is? It's a hornet's nest. Huh, so you're not dumber than a stump after all. And what do you think of hornets? Huh? Oh, so now you're deaf. I said, what do you think of hornets? I hate them. Why? Because they're ornery. So are the dogs. Only when you mess with them, hornets are ornery for no darn good reason. <laughs> oh, there's a reason. Tell me, Daniel, why are hornets important? They ain't important, ain't they? Son, I may just barely be able to suffer your prancing about this house like a Betty, but I cannot suffer your ignorance. What? The hornet has a purpose, just like you, me, everyone. My purpose is to farm this <coughs> land, take care of my wife, raise my children. Your purpose seems to get on my last damn nerve. <laughs> and Cola's purpose is to look after you. And these hornets, they've got a purpose as well. You wouldn't be sleeping in that comfortable bed of yours or have that roof over your head if not for these here hornets. Daniel looks confused. The hornet kills the aphid. The hornet kills a hornworm. The hornet kills just about every damn kind of caterpillar that crawls, chews, and creeps. And what do all those things do, Daniel? Turn into butterflies? God damn it, boy. <laughs> and, and some turn into moths. And, and, yes, and what? And kill our crops? That's right. They kill our crops. And the hornet kills all of them. But it isn't just that they kill them, it's how they kill them that's so important to understand. 
Father reaches into his pocket, pulls out some tobacco and rolling papers, and begins to roll himself a cigarette as he speaks. You see, the hornet don't sting him or bite him till they die. No, the hornet flies up and stuns him. It paralyzes him. And then it lays its eggs inside of them while they're still living. The little critter wakes up, wonders what the hell just happened to it. Was that a dream? <laughs> then it goes about its business like nothing ever happened. But something did happen, didn't it? Those eggs hatch. Then the little baby hornet larvae start to eat the critter alive from the inside. Till one day its skin falls off and it explodes. One second it's a healthy caterpillar and the next it's a bunch of little hornets out in the world looking for the next victim so they can deliver the same fate. Dad, that's, that's awful. I think it's beautiful. Why would you think some animal getting its guts eaten while it's still alive is beautiful? Because to me it's a sign. Of what? God's justice. I don't understand. You see, the devil, he put the aphid, the hornworm, and the caterpillar on the God-fearing man's land. Our Lord up in heaven, he created us in his image. And he gave us the ability to tame the land, harvest the land. And he even gave us the cursed children of Ham to aid us in our mission so that we might be fruitful, so that we might bring him glory. But then the devil made these things, the aphid, the hornworm, as a pestilence upon us to remind us that if we let down our guard for even a single moment, that even the Lord's kind graces could not protect us from him. But then, see, I believe that God heard our pleas for help in battling back these insidious minions of the devil, and so he gave us the hornet, not just to aid us, but to do so in a way that showed the devil how horrible our Lord's justice could be, to put fear in the devil's heart when he even thinks about placing these burdens upon his children, you, me, your mother, your sister. God says to the devil, I will not simply push back your agents, no. I will tear apart their insides, make them suffer until their very last breath, put terror in their hearts, and by extension yours, by delivering a death that is, is as precognitive as it is inevitable, as painful as it is horrible, the worst kind of death, the Lord's brand of death. So you see the hornet, if you think about it, ought to be revered. It's not a pest. It's not ornery. It's one of God's little winged angels. Still. Can't have all little angels up there stinging our visitors when they come inside the house. Get that nest down. <laughs> Sir, get it down. Father pulls out a ladder and sets it against the wall. It's topped just under where the wasp nest hangs. The angry buzzing gets a little louder. Daniel stands there staring at Father. The Father's face betrays no emotions. He stares back at him. Reluctantly, Daniel turns to Colas, then points up to the wasp nest and makes a pulling gesture, signaling him to get it down. Cole's eyes go wide with fear, but he nonetheless slowly begins to make his way over to the ladder. No, I didn't say use your shadow. Colas, you stay right there. Yes, sir. You get it down yourself, son. But how, sir? Father places the now finished cigarette into his mouth. He strikes a match, lights it, and takes a long drag. He doesn't answer Daniel. He's waiting. When Daniel realizes no answer is coming, he walks over to the ladder and begins to climb it. Father and Colas watch as he slowly ascends. Less than halfway to the top, he smacks at his arm and he's stung the first time. Ow! He continues ascending. Another sting makes him flail at his leg. Ow! Now sobbing, Daniel finally reaches the top and stretches out his arm to pull down the nest. The buzzing now rises to a roar as Daniel is beset by biting, stinging wasps. He flails at his arms, legs, and back. In one final stretch, he yanks the nest from the ceiling and tosses it to the ground. Not a second later, still swatting at the stinging insects, he falls from the ladder. Master Daniel! Colas lunges towards the falling Daniel as the lights go dark. <laughs> Thanks. Kemp Powers. Next up, can I just say for a second, we are like listening to plays that have never been done before, written, like spoken by playwrights. That's amazing. <laughs> Next up is Anne Garcia Romero. Her plays include Providence, which was seen at the Eugene O'Neill National Playwrights Conference, Paloma, which is a National Latino Playwriting Award runner-up, Earthquake Chica, National Latino Playwriting Award finalist, Mary Domingo, Goodman Theater Commission, Mary Peabody in Cuba, Latin, National Latino Playwriting Award finalist. She teaches at the Department of Film, Television, and Theater at the New University of Notre Dame. And please come up. I'm going to sit uh, at the table and read you a scene from my play Paloma. 
Um, I play Paloma is about two characters, Paloma and Ibrahim. They live in New York City. They're both NYU graduate students. They've been born and raised in New York City. Um, this is the second scene of the play, and it takes place at NYU. <coughs> scene two, on the essence of love. September 22nd, 2003, early evening. Ibrahim and Paloma study in the New York University Library. They read to each other. Paloma, love, may God honor you, begins with riddles and ends in truth, Ibrahim. And because it is sublime, its subtle definition cannot be deciphered, Paloma, nor its essence understood <coughs> without generous determination, Ibrahim. We know that the essence of attraction or the separation between created things arises from the affinity or repulsion between them. Paloma, therefore, love is a rebellious illness. Ibrahim, whose medicine exists within itself if we know how to treat it. Paloma, but it's a delicious illness and an appetizing sickness. Those who don't have it curse their health, Ibrahim. Those who have it don't want to find a cure. They put down their books. Paloma. And so apparently, Ibn Hazm had it going on in 11th century Spain. <laughs> Ibrahim. And so he wrote his treatise on love, Ring of the Dove, in the original Arabic, Tawak al Hamama, in Spanish, El Collar, Paloma, El Collar. Ibrahim, el collar de la paloma. Paloma, my name, Ibrahim, paloma. Paloma, aha, uh -huh, means dove. There, then there's flores, Ibrahim, paloma, flores. Paloma, flowers, Ibrahim, flores de paloma. Paloma, flowers of the dove, right here. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> you have good pronunciation, you speak. Hablas español? Ibrahim, un poco, no mucho. Uh, El collar de la paloma, paloma, tawak al hamama, ring of the dove, Ibrahim. So, why ring? Why dove? Paloma, well, collar means necklace or maybe neck ring, and paloma means pigeon or dove, Ibrahim. Both? I like dove better. Paloma, yeah. And so, Professor Gomez mentioned that the dove also represents the soul in the Neoplatonist philosophy that influenced even Hassam. Weren't you paying attention to his lecture? Ibrahim, I guess I was kind of distracted in class today. Okay, so the dove represents the soul and Paloma, and the ring of the dove refers to humankind's attempt to guide, i.e. put a ring around one's divine soul, i.e. dove. Ibrahim, great, what else did I miss? Paloma, well, um, after his friend wrote him a letter asking for romantic advice, e even Hazm described rules, Ibrahim, on how to love. Paloma, kick-ass rules. Ibrahim, do they still uh, apply? Paloma, I think they just might. Ibrahim, so are you suggesting we try to apply them? Paloma, is that a come on? Ibrahim, too obvious. Paloma, kinda. Ibrahim, oh. Paloma, I mean, it's not like I'm not into obvious come ons, it's just in this context. Ibrahim, yeah. Paloma, in the NYU library? Ibrahim, in a study room. Paloma, in the afternoon? Ibrahim, early evening, actually. Paloma, study session. Ibrahim, random context, you're right. Paloma, not a bad context, just kinda Ibrahim, random. Paloma, unexpected. Ibrahim, not always a bad thing. Paloma, not always. Ibrahim, could kinda fit in with the study partner thing. Paloma, huh? Ibrahim, partner, couple, study, learn, just, you know, different context. Paloma, why are you even taking this course? Ibrahim, attraction to Paloma, okay. Ibrahim, to this subject matter for my master's in Islamic studies. Paloma, because Ibrahim, I so dig that period and location in history in light of, you know, now. Paloma, you mean like all the residual anxiety and antagonism in the atmosphere hovering over our entire society? Ibrahim, uh, there is that. <laughs> and you? Paloma, I need this course for my master's in world history. This one covers transnational themes, so yeah, ancient Muslim Spain. Ibrahim, Al-Andalus. 
Paloma, 800 years. Ibrahim, three religions, Paloma, Islam, Ibrahim, Christianity, Paloma, Judaism, La Convivencia, Ibrahim, coexisting peacefully. Right, exactly, I mean, yeah. And plus, there are definite benefits. Paloma, two, Ibrahim taking his course. Paloma, and they are, Ibrahim points to Paloma. Paloma, ah, Ibrahim, yeah, Paloma, there is that. Next up, we have Rogelio Martinez. Great, right, I told you I was surprised you didn't go on. Um, so the LARC Play Development Center announced uh, that he was the inaugural recipient of the, the LARC Mid-Career Playwriting Fellowship. Yes. This award is for, uh, from the New York City-based Playwrights Laboratory. is designed to ensure economic stability for playwrights at transformative junctures in their careers. Thank you, LARC Play Development Center. Uh, for the Denver Center, he's writing a play about Reagan and Gorbachev, which will compete, uh, complete his Cold War trilogy, which includes Ping Pong and Born in East Berlin. Ladies and gentlemen, Rogelio Martinez. Hi. <laughs> All right, so, um, well, actually, the light's pretty good here, so I might be able to read. Uh, Okay, so uh, this is the first scene of um, the play that I'm working on, on Reagan, who is very difficult to write about because I have no clue what's going on inside his head. So if I skip a page by mistake, it's okay. <laughs> then it's consistent with the tone of the play. So hopefully at some point I'll drop these and then I'll be, you know, and then we'll find a structure. So... Um, First scene, a light on a nurse. In the void somewhere, there's a man in a wheelchair. Uh, his back is to us. He's Ronald Reagan, the nurse. He talks about riding out into the sunset. He used to hum me this one piece of music. I've looked at all his movies, but can't find what he's, what he's referring to. Uh, this was when I first started working. I, I tried to talk to her once about this, and... Well, she dismissed me. Then a few days later, she sat me down in the den and made it clear that I was not to correct him. So there's this music, but then there's this other sound he talks about almost always at the same time. There's a swish, 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 swish. Really loud, he explains. Can, well, can one really call it explaining? I suppose my job is to understand, so explaining is as good a word as any. He says the sound is loud until well, you're right there, and then, then it doesn't sound as loud. These two things, well, someone once told me that what we do with our memories is to create some kind of story. That's why we remember things wrongly. It doesn't fit our story. This is what seems to be happening. He's, he's trying to tell a story, and even when our memories don't match up, he, he just pulls them together. There are memories where he wasn't even there for them, but he pulls them into his story or even if it didn't happen, it becomes part of the story. A technician wearing Reeboks and a sweatshirt walks by, technician, uh, we're ready whenever, and the uh, technician's gone. Uh, an RCA 1930s mic nearby, there's a teletype. An assistant enters and hands the man in the wheelchair a piece of paper, Reagan. The assistant has a non-matching shirt, pants, he sits next to Reagan as information comes over the teletype. As the pages come, the assistant passes them to Reagan. Uh, Reagan. Uh, the Cubs trail New York, 3-0. Uh, Willie McRae is at the plate, balled off two pitches. Hauser is getting a brave at first, and uh, he's a few steps from the bag. Throw to first, safe, infield is in. This is, uh, this is Wilson's seventh pitch, full count. Cray swings, foul ball down the first baseline. The teletype breaks down. The assistant panics. The two continue to look at one another, but then Reagan continues. Oh, you can see the frustration on Wilson's face. What, whatever he's got, McCray is falling off. Wilson has had a tough time with McCray this whole game. The, 
The pitcher goes to the Rosenberg. He's trying to slow down the game. The assistant's panicking. He's trying to fix the machine. Uh, the teletype is clearly not working, and Reagan's just making it up. Uh, it hasn't been an easy day. The young man has allowed three runs. The Yankees are not done with him. He can only slow down the game so long. Wilson goes to the mound, but now it's McCray backing off. He cleans his cleats, and they usually like to keep things moving, the Yankees do. But now these two are just playing a whole new game. The teletype starts to work again. Reagan, all right, here we go. McCray swings. The ball goes right past the shortstop. Hauser comes around third. Kinsley in right. Field throws home. The play at the plate. Hauser slides safe. McCray easily takes second. Yankees take a four-point lead. The game seems to be picking up now with a second baseman, White, at the plate. The teletype continues to bring the information in, and the lights shift. The assistant is cleaning up. Reagan is putting on his coat. Uh, assistant, how do you do it? What's that? You've never been to New York, but I was right there with you. Well, the machine there has the facts. The rest, well, there isn't anyone listening and watching the game at the same time. You mean there isn't anyone to say you're wrong? The technician from earlier walks by. We're ready when you are, Mr. President. A second assistant enters. May I take your coat? Reagan hesitates but hands over his coat. Second assistant. And uh, here's what you'll be saying. Reagan, uh, what are these lines over here? Second assistant, you circled them. You wanted to put some emphasis, and technician says, sound check. Reagan taps the mic. It's no longer a 1930s RCA, but something more advanced. It's the 80s. It works. Technician, ready? Reagan, uh, you need me, technician. Just use whatever voice. Reagan, understand. Technician, OK, ready over here. Reagan says, uh, my fellow Americans, I'm pleased to announce I've just signed legislation that will outlaw the Soviet Union forever. We begin bombing in five minutes. Reagan smiles, everyone in the room laughs, people in the shadows we've never seen before. Reagan says, how was that? Technician, good, good to go. Three, two, green light comes up. Reagan says, my fellow Americans, I'm pleased to tell you that today I signed legislation that will allow student religious groups to begin enjoying a right they've too long been denied. The freedom to meet in public uh, high school students during non-high school hours, just as other student groups are allowed to do. Uh, at that moment, Secretary of State George Schultz appears, and several aides are taking notes. Schultz, Mr. President, Reagan, rest that voice. She insists she's right. Mr. President, go on. I need to urgently sit down. Good. Now come out with it, Schultz. Uh, the Soviets got their hands on the recording, Reagan. It was a sound check, Schultz. They got their hands on it, Reagan. Who's responsible? Schultz. Well, that's an issue Casey's taken up, but there's a more pressing problem, Reagan. There's a mole, Schultz. Well, they could have picked it up from a van half a mile away. We didn't do a sweep of the neighborhood. Why not? It wasn't classified. It was the other thing during the sound check that got us, Reagan. That has them all in a huff, Schultz. That has us all in a huff. Reagan sits down, Schultz says, Mr. President, Japanese and U.S. intelligence just broke a coded message coming from Vladivostok. The Soviets are on red alert. The order clears the way for Soviet military action against the United States. A fleet of Soviet nuclear subs on the coast are on full alert. Japan is now on high alert. Several American naval bases in Alaska have been mobilized. They didn't find it funny. <laughs> <laughs> Reagan, did you get in touch with their embassy? Schultz, there's a problem. We scramble all signals out of their embassy. This makes it difficult for them to stay in touch with Moscow. It means they can't call home. Reagan, unscramble them. Schultz, it's not as easy as it sounds. Reagan, I can press a button in that suitcase there, and we can blow up the world. We could do all that, but we can't just let the Soviets call home. Schultz, uh, you're suggesting, Reagan, I'm suggesting we get in touch with them now. Schultz, then we can't contain the story. Uh, an aide says, elections are coming up soon. Reagan looks at the young aide and says, I know that. I don't need to be reminded, Schultz. This won't be an easy one to control, Reagan. You're worried about elections. That makes sense to all of you? If we blow up the world, I will be a one-term president. Does that make it any more real, young man? Um, Schultz motions for the aide to go, but just as he starts, a second aide comes in. 
Um, then at that moment, uh, there's a quick light change uh, and there's a press conference. Schultz, uh, no comment. And there's a French reporter. Is the president of the care of a trained psychologist? <laughs> Schultz, is that a serious question? <laughs> British reporter, his behavior is not the behavior of a man in charge of the world's greatest nuclear arsenal. Schultz, what is your question? Uh, it was not very funny. It could have. Schultz, what is your question? British reporter, the obsession with the destruction, Schultz says. Allow me to clear something up. The Soviet Union has a greater nuclear arsenal. Let's get the facts correct. Next question. British reporter, you didn't answer, Schultz. You didn't ask a question. Next. Among the reporters is Helen Thomas. Helen Thomas, he insists calling the Soviet Union the evil empire. He wishes it outlaw. Is it safe to assume this will be his platform for the coming election? <laughs> Schultz, I have not spoken to him about such matters. Helen, is it safe to assume he will have a platform? Schultz, Helen, um, Helen, does he plan to run again? He is already the oldest. Schultz, Helen, you're the oldest person at the post. You're the oldest person in this room. Do you plan on quitting anytime soon? Helen, not as long as he's in office. Schultz, he's not cashing in on his Social Security, if that's what you're asking, Helen. Many fear Social Security won't exist once he's done with it. Schultz, well, that's irrational, Helen. You're calling the American people. Helen, this might come as a surprise to you, but you're not the American people. Uh, high Trout, New York Times, the president has failed these last three years to meet face to face with a Soviet general. Is it safe to say the feelings expressed in the recording match his intentions? Schultz. Uh, Mark, the president has looked for ways to reach out to old Soviet secretary generals, but keep in mind he's been in office three years, and during this time, the Soviet Union has had two leaders die almost within a year of one another. New York Times, has he been in contact with their new leader? Schultz, there have been no official exchanges made between Secretary General Shonenko and the President. America, um, does the President intend to get, Schultz, the better question mark is whether Secretary General Shonenko plans to die anytime soon. Obviously, there's, once, there's only so much the New York Times can know. But if you figure it out, be sure to let us know. Thank you. Next up, we have Robert Schenken. Who, yes! Who is, of course, a Pulitzer Prize winning, Tony Award winning, Writers Guild Award winning, two time, two time Emmy Award nominated writer of stage, television, and film. His Tony Award winning play, All the Way, is currently running at the Denver Center Stage Theater. He co-wrote the feature films The Quiet American, and, which is a gorgeous film, uh, Hacksaw Ridge, and the television credits include All the Way, The Pacific, The Andromeda Strain, and Spartacus. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Schenck. I'm not sure I've had quite enough Diet Coke for this, but... Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> um, I thought I'd, I'd just take a page from last night and uh, read the opening scene. Um, this is for The Great Society, which is the sequel to All the Way. <laughs> Spot up on LBJ standing center stage, the witnesses enter, chanting, All the way with LBJ! All the way with LBJ! All the way with LBJ! The chant builds to a crescendo and cuts off. LBJ speaks directly to the audience. One year when he was feeling flush, my daddy took us all to the rodeo. Boiled peanuts, big dill pickles the size of your fist, and pink cotton candy for the kids. For the adults, shiner beer topped off with a snort of homebrew from a pocket flask. There was rope tricks and clowns and barrel races and bronc busting, but the thing everybody came for, the thing everybody wanted to see, was the bull riding. You could get up close in those days. And I stood right there by the gate, my eyes as big as saucers, as they led the biggest, ugliest, meanest looking bull I have ever seen in my life into the chute. And then this good old boy, 
more balls than brains, <laughs> carefully climbed on board. He shoved his one gloved hand under the rope around the bull and he worked it this way and that, checking his grip till he got it just right. And the bull snorted once and every muscle on his body twitched. And the good old boy took a breath and he nodded at his friends and said, here we go. They released the gate and 2,700 pounds of horns, hooves, and hate exploded into the arena, twisting left and right, bucking up and down. Everybody gets thrown. Everybody. Sometimes you come down so hard you break your back. Sometimes the bull comes back and gores you and stomps you while you're lying there until they drive it away. Sometimes you don't ever get up. So why would you do that? Why would anybody do that? Well, there was this one moment in his short ride when I could see that good old boy's face and, you know, maybe it was a trick of the light. But there was such a look of joy, of triumph. Check your grip. Take a breath. Here we go. Blackout. <laughs> Good God, man. <laughs> Have you finished writing this play? Then leave and don't come back till you're done. Because <laughs> we need to see this play. Uh, next up is Regina Taylor. Yeah. Who I must say uh, should be the next Martha in uh, Who's Afraid of Regina Wolf? <laughs> But only if they cast Robert Schenken as George. <laughs> For those of you who witnessed the first scene last night, it was electrifying. Uta Hagen, who is that? <laughs> Regina Taylor is an accomplished actress, playwright, and director. Last summer, she directed her play Stop Reset. Is it Stop Dot Reset or Stop Reset? Stop Reset. There you go, at the Goodman Theater. Extending the storytelling beyond the theater stage to diverse communities by way of live events and internet portals. Uh, Regina Taylor's play Crowns continues to be one of the most performed musicals in the country and was produced at the Denver Center in 2005, which was also Kent Thompson's first year as artistic director. A story pairing. Ladies and gentlemen, Regina Taylor. Thank you. Um, this is a piece that was done before but I'm coming back at it as a musical. So doing that, I've been looking at it, uh, looking at the arias. So uh, there are three pieces I'd like to share with you. Um, it's called Magnolia. It was first done when, <laughs> it was uh, first done uh, as Obama uh, became president, and it's a take on the cherry orchard. Uh, I, I like coming back to it right now because um, we think we've gone through certain things. We think we can close the door and walk away from a burning house and never return. The thing about that is at a certain point, the roots pull us back. Um, we're all bound together by the twisted, knotty roots. Uh, Three characters. One is Lily, the next is Carlotta, and the other is Thomas. Thomas is the businessman who hasn't gone back to the plantation where he was born for 20 years. That's the last one. Uh, this one, uh, just imagine me as Lily, who is this white woman of a certain time, trying to find freedom. 
Boys will be boys, but a woman, hmm, a forest woman. There's some bourbon, would you please? In the desert of Arabia, you know I could never tan, I dyed my skin and hair with hennas made by a Tunisian holy man. I traveled to Marrakesh with the Bedouin. I dressed as a boy. A woman could never travel by herself alone. I called myself Abdul Hawk. It means servant of the truth. Abdul could go wherever he wanted, do whatever he wanted, and no one ever knew. Boys traveling with men through the desert are sometimes used as concubines. Still, no one ever knew who I was, what <coughs> I was. Every month, your grandmother would send a girl all the way to Athens to pick up her cigarettes. Athens, Georgia, so that no one would recognize a maid from the forest household. And every Tuesday afternoon, your mother would sit with a short glass of bourbon, and she would smoke three cigarettes and nurse that one drink for the hours before the children came back from school. I discovered this one day. I had come home early. I saw her smoking and drinking and humming, her face to the sun. She never looked happier than on her Tuesday afternoons when she thought she was alone and free. Carlotta is a black woman. I don't know nothing about birth and no babies. <laughs> I went in for that role. <laughs> Didn't get it. That butterfly heifer stole it from me. I wanted to audition for men. Hattie McDaniels got it. They said I wasn't hefty enough. I was a skinny little something back then. Couldn't have been more than 90 pounds soaking wet. They, uh, they wanted somebody big and fat to play Mammy. I told Selznick that I was born to play that role. Why does Mammy have to be so fat? Why can't Mammy be a skinny colored woman? Oh, he just laughed. Said he had a part perfect for me. I went in. I lost my place. <laughs> I went in. I don't know nothing about birth and no babies. Oh, Victor Fleming, the director, was crawling on the floor. I swear he peed laughing so hard. Knew I had it. Knew that part was mine. Then that butterfly heifer, and I'm not spreading no tales about it, because everybody knew how she got that role. Not that I knew her personally, but everybody who knew her personally knew, and that's all I have to say about that person. Everybody would know my name now. What the hell kind of name is butterfly anyhow? And hey, when she won that damn Oscar, that could have been mine. <laughs> After that, I took my act on the road that night. That bitch won my Oscar. <laughs> I went back to my nightclub act, told Hollywood to kiss my black ass. Been on the road since I was six years old. My mama and daddy both dead. I don't remember them much. Don't remember my name, my real name, or how old I am exactly, but I feel young. 
So showbiz folk took me and traveled all over Kansas, Wyoming, Chicago, South America, Europe, that black, that heifer got my Oscar. <laughs> I got my boys together, Carletta, Mendoza, and the Jungle Kings. I was married to um, a Cuban with a wandering eye. That's how I got my neck slit in 1950. His other wife, she jumped me right in the middle of a set, jumped up on my stage, teach you to mess with my man. She cut my throat. Then she stabbed out my husband's eye, the one I leave you. You better be sure to keep it on me. And he left out with her. Oh, couldn't blame her for that. Oh, she didn't cut me too deep. Didn't lose my voice. Just lost my taste for the road. What else could I do except hide out as a mammy? What else? Who else could I be in those days? Mm. Uh, uh, Thomas, a uh, black man, uh, hasn't gone back to the plantation in 20 years. Been calling Lily Forrest every day for the past week. Catch up a little on the phone, but no time, no time to hear what I got to say. Time's running out. Two more weeks, that land will be sold. What's it to do with me? Who are they to me who owned my great-grandma, great-great-grandpa, who built that estate with their own hands, those hands owned by Nathan Bedford Forrest Kent, all that business. Passing on. Nothing to do with me. All are dead and gone now. I'm the last of the colored line of forests. Every one of them are buried out there in the colored cemetery, just below the river where I was baptized. All of them buried out there below the river. Out under them magnolia trees. My mom, she died pushing me out. My pa slapped me. And I took my first breath. And then my brother, firstborn son, Pa's heart, it broke that day. Pa died on that day. It just took years for him to let them lay him in the ground. Still, some things never die. Like what he said to me when they cut my brother's body down. Paul said to me, it should have been you. It should have been you. You ain't worth the dirt you was born from. I walked away from that place the very next day and said, I was never coming back. Yesterday, Miss Lily called, asked me to come out there to meet her this morning. I haven't been back in over 20 years. I get out of the car and I'm standing in the middle of this place that named me. I remember strong what I hated about it. Don't remember being so, the smell and the earth so black. The servants' quarters where I was born, a blue-green shade worn down, and the east meadow where my pa drunk, he beat me good most nights. Same meadow he taught me to ride my first horse. Funny how some memories can eat up other memories. Some things we forget like they never happened. Other things harder to shake like your shadow, our shadows with us to the day we die. I think our shadow lives way after we're gone, like my father's shadow dragging me back, like my father's voice. I feel the weight of his voice like hands wrapped around my neck, strangling me before I can even yelp. I stand silent in this yard. Yeah. I'm walking towards the house when 
Who do I see? Leaning over the vegetable bed, a tall, thin woman, white as cotton, flaming red hair. I could swear it was my grandma, Minerva, and then my Aunt Bessie, Uncle Theo, Great Aunt Cleola, my own mother. She's there. They're all of them surrounding me, their voices rustling the leaves. They're falling from the branches like blossoms, magnolia blossoms, grown too heavy with their own scent, secrets, and memories. All these ghosts I thought I left behind surrounding me as I'm walking towards the house, knocking on the door of the house. I'm standing in the threshold, trying to summon the courage to open my mouth, to call out my own name. And then I hear this sound crying, hollers, voices rushing like water out of the mouth of that house. No. I can't believe Miss Martha Forrest is dead. Lucky. Next up, we have Andrew Hinderacker. His play Colossal received a National New Play Network rolling premiere in 2014. Other plays include I Am Going to Change the World, Dirty, Kingsville, and Suicide Incorporated, which premiered at The Gift in 2010 and was subsequently produced off-Broadway at the Roundabout Theatre Company in New York. Andrew's play Colossal, featuring a dance company, a drumline, and a fully padded football team, was the recent recipient of multiple awards from the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. He is currently a writer on the Showtime series, Penny Dreadful. Andrew? Um, hey, everyone. Uh, my name's Andrew. I just moved to Denver from Chicago. <laughs> You're a vocal crew. Uh, and I just want to uh, uh, thank Doug for asking us out to uh, uh, follow Robert Shankin and Regina Taylor. That's very good. <laughs> Thanks, that's awesome. Appreciate that. Um, so let's just all collectively lower our expectations. And uh, great, so Brett, you can stop hiding the wings and come on out. Um, uh, Brett Schneider is a, a magician and an actor based in Chicago, and we've been collaborating on this project for about the past three years. Uh, it's a piece called The Magic Play, and uh, we're going to get to, you just tell me when you're set up. You're set up, great. Um, uh, we're just going to do a small piece of it. It's um, uh, a piece where Brett plays a magician who comes out to do a show and pretty quickly gets interrupted uh, with the memory of a partner who's just left him that morning. Uh, so you'll suffer through my performance of that, but essentially... In the present tense, there's a, a show going on, a magic show going on, uh, while simultaneously there are scenes from the past that are happening as well. Um, so we're going to jump in kind of in the middle of the first act, and, I, and hopefully uh, it will make sense. Cool. Thanks. Um, good? Cool. Uh, and it's not until a few months later that he does this brand new trick for me. Yeah, I really don't want to do that trick tonight. Yeah, I really don't care. See, that's the thing about memory. Unlike every other facet of your life, it's not something you get to control. Go ahead, show them. These people came to see some magic, son. They don't give a fuck about the magician. So go ahead. Show them the trick that broke my heart. you can see I've got a nail in my pocket. No, no, do it right. With all the pretty patter. All that carefully crafted language to make this feel more special than it actually is. Seduce them with lies. Ladies, gentlemen, and otherwise defined, you, you may remember earlier in my show I handed my volunteer a pocket knife and 
you may have even thought that that seems like an awfully dangerous way to open a box of cards. And of course, that was the point. Of course, I said, be very careful, please, to conjure the image of something very sharp. And very dangerous, cutting someone's hand. <laughs> and just to demonstrate that this nail is, in fact, brutally sharp. This is the first part of the trick. For the second part, you, the audience, will choose a single card. And to get down to that card, we need to eliminate some options. So right here in the first row, if you could simply just shout out left or right. Ah, uh, left. Left. Very well. We will eliminate the cards in my left hand. Uh, let's see here. Right here in the first row, uh, you could simply say face down or face up. Face down, very well. I will dribble off the cards until you tell me when to stop. Leading me with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cards. Thank you very much. And let's see over here. Um, I know you, that's not fair at all. <laughs> Tell me your name. After all, I'm the magician. I should be able to tell you. So just think of your name in your mind. Repeat it over and over in your mind. Dan? Dan? No, you say no. Daniel? No. Dan? It's not Danielle, is it? It is? Is that? <laughs> no? Does that mean anything to you? <laughs> That's your girlfriend. <laughs> we'll try to clear her out of your head for just one moment. <laughs> just think about your name. Do me a favor, I have seven cards in my hand. Could you please name a number between one and seven? Um, three. Three! Thank you, Steve. One, two, three. Leaving me with the eight of clubs. And Steve, if you could hold on to the eight of clubs for me. Thank you very much. And the eight of clubs is the second part of the trick. For the third and final part, I will need a volunteer. So, um, right here in the first row, you're nodding already, perfect. <laughs> what, what is your name? Jennifer. Jennifer, do you mind joining me on stage? Right. Ladies, gentlemen, and otherwise to find a round of applause for Jennifer. Thank you so much. You can stand right here. Jennifer, I'd like you to verify that this nail is, in fact, brutally sharp. Just please be careful. Brutally sharp. Brutally sharp. <laughs> you have a standard brown paper bag, yes? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can see, I have three other brown paper bags. And Jennifer, mm -hmm. inside each of these is a block of wood and no nail. Harmless. Not so harmless. <laughs> now, many of you have seen different versions of this game. Sometimes it's done with three shells and a pea. Sometimes on a stadium jumbotron. Yeah. The rules are the same. It's a hustling game. <laughs> you try to follow the object. I fool you and take your money. Okay. Except in this version of the game, Jennifer, I not only want you to guess correctly, I need you to be right. Okay. Okay. In a moment, I'm going to spin these bags. 
And I'm guessing a lot of them are going to lose track of this object. But I'm trusting that you won't. Are you ready to begin? I'm ready. I already lost it. It's all the time we have for you. Jennifer, I trust you, uh, maybe more than you trust yourself, as a matter of fact. But I mentioned that my version of the game would be a little different, so I don't want you to point to the bag that has the nail. I'd like you to point to one of the three bags that is safe. Okay. This one. This one. You do not believe there is a nail in this bag, is that correct? Right. And... <laughs> Now that you fully understand the nature of the game, the stakes have raised considerably. Um, Jennifer, my hands are... I'm, if there is anything worthwhile about me, it's all right here. And I am putting the fate of my hands in yours. Because... Because that's what trust is. When I was getting this piece ready for performance, he... Uh, came over to, you know, be my volunteer, and after I smashed that first bag, he's like, there's no way there's a nail in one of those bags. There's no way? Swapped it out or something. There's no nail. No. Well then, can I see your hand? <laughs> and then I asked Tim, as, as I'll ask you, Jennifer, uh, to uh, please point to a bag. <laughs> this one. <laughs> and there's this moment of exhilaration um, immediately followed by... Well, that's just proof. You'd never do that if there was actually a nail. I mean, right? Of course there's a nail. To truly put ourselves in each other's hands, you have to take a risk. And it's going to be this lovely moment, right, where I let him smash my hand down wherever he wants because I'm willing to risk getting hurt because I trust him. But then he... so that if there really is a nail, we both get hurt. Jennifer, could you please point to one more bag? Go for that one. This one? You can change your mind if you'd like. <laughs> You like that one? Are you sure? You want to stick with this bag? Okay, because when people go home tonight, they're going to wonder what if she had changed her mind. Jennifer, my trust in you was very well founded. And Jennifer, just to verify, can you make sure this nail is still in fact? Brutally sharp. Brutally sharp. And Jennifer, as you can see, there's a playing card on this nail, a card that's been there this entire time. That card was actually a prediction because Steve, right? Steve, you're, I'm sorry, I had Maurice in my head for some weird reason, but. Uh, Steve, you're holding onto a card? A card that the audience arrived at through a series of decisions, left or right, face up or face down, one through seven, you said three, leaving us with what card do you have in your hand? Holding the eight of clubs. The eight of clubs. Jennifer, if you could please remove this card from the nail. What card are you holding in your hand? The eight of clubs. The eight of clubs? The eight of clubs. That is your card. A round of applause for Jennifer and Steve. Thank you so much. And all of our volunteers. Thank you. And of course, after I do the trick, he's just standing there, staring at me. And of course, I think it's because it was 
so impressive, like he's literally spellbound to silence. <laughs> it's not bad, right? That's uh, straight up insane. Yeah, thank you. No, that you would, um, that you take something so meaningful and turn it into patter for a cheap trick. Ooh. It's not a cheap trick. Yeah, that would be the thing that offends <laughs> you. Uh, what's the line? Um, uh, the only way we're putting ourselves. The only way we're really putting ourselves into each other's hands if, if we truly take a risk. Yeah, do you not? You didn't take a risk. Am I wrong? That depends on how you define risk. Oh, okay. Uh, when I jump off the diving board and throw my head six inches from spinal injury, that's risk. But I know you. And there's no way you'd do that trick if you hadn't already swapped out the nail or if I had absolutely no choice at all. Or both. And I remember I said that so proudly, like I, I didn't, or both motherfucker, but, but basically. <laughs> and as soon as I say it, I can feel something shift. That moment when a lover no longer sees you through a lover's eyes. That's it, that's all we got. We're <laughs> I was not aware when I introduced this that this was a match set. So I want to introduce you to Brett Schneider. Where's Brett? <laughs> Brett has been performing magic professionally for over 15 years. He's a member of the world famous Magic Castle in Hollywood, California. Yes. Indeed. His work has received numerous awards and citations, including San Francisco Stage Magician of the Year, and he was a finalist in the World Magic Seminar held in Las Vegas. He has performed in Andrews the Magic Play at the Goodman Theater's New Stages in 2014. Uh, I think that and all of our writers deserve a hearty round of applause. Death defying. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. Can I get all the playwrights together for a picture? <laughs> Do we need the audience for that? No, we don't need the audience for that. Good night. Thank you all. <laughs>